so maybe we should start. I'm Carol Runyon. I think I know most of you. I'm a faculty member in uh, the School of Public Health and Director of the Pediatric Injury Prevention Education Research Program that is one of the co-sponsors of this seminar. The other is the Department of Epidemiology. Um, before announcing or before introducing Hank Weiss, our speaker today, um, I will alert you that the next seminar in the Piper uh, seminar series is jointly sponsored with Preventive Medicine, and it will be October 7th, um, featuring Larry Cohen from the Prevention Institute, um, and uh, talking about some aspect of health equity. So we, we will have more details to follow, right, Carolina? Is, is that a noon time as well? Yeah. Seven. 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 Yeah. And, and Larry's always great to listen to. Yeah, he's, he's a terrific speaker and leader in um, public health. So put that on your calendars. But we have another terrific speaker and leader in public health today, Hank Weiss. Dr. Weiss um, is an epidemiologist who is here from New Zealand. Um, he was uh, we fortunate that he was coming to a conference in Boulder um, and was offered to come down and give a seminar. And he got out of Boulder yesterday afternoon amidst the floods and made it to Denver. Um, he's been in New Zealand for the last four years directing the Injury Prevention Research Unit at the University of Otago. Um, before that um, was the director of the Injury Control Research Center at Pittsburgh, University of Pittsburgh. Um, and before that has, has held positions in state government um, related to surveillance and injury prevention. Um, I know he's interested in a number of topics. Uh, but today's topic is on bicycling, and I'll just let him go from there. Thank you. I now know what the word, what the phrase "sheltering in place" means, <laughs> since our, our hotel in Boulder was the Millennium Hotel, which backs up against Boulder Creek. So uh, let's see. Wednesday night was exciting. I heard it got even better last night, but fortunately, I had left. So thank you, Carol. Um, it's a pleasure to, to be here again. Uh, all the way from New Zealand, 7,341 air miles as the crow flies from, from uh, Auckland. And uh, it's certainly not bikeable most of the way. Um, as you know, uh, it's a place of well-deserved beauty, uh, especially from the ground, not just, not just the air. Uh, this is Mount Cook up close, the, the tallest peak in New Zealand. Uh, it really is a, a beautiful place, and it's a great place for cycle tourism as well. The, the lines here depict our newly, newly developed off-road trails. So if you ever get a chance to visit New Zealand and you're an avid cyclist, these off-road trails are, are, are just fantastic. A lot of money has gone into that because of uh, trying to attract the tourist dollar. I wish, as you will see, uh, as much money would be put into our roadways uh, to make them safe for, for the current residents, but uh, that hasn't quite happened yet. So at, at the risk of turning this into an unintended tourist board promotion, let me just share with you uh, a couple of pictures here. Uh, this is a South Island scene, and I guess you have scenery like this in, in Colorado. You don't have to feel ashamed of what you see here. But of course, it's not a short bike ride from there to a scene like this, and that's one of the fun things about New Zealand is you can do that uh, it, it, in a matter of hours, so it is an incredible place. So uh, the tourist uh, part of, of the talk has ended, but uh, perhaps we'll see some of you there in New Zealand. Story number one, cycling back, speeding down the wooded green steep winding stretch, a cyclist approached a car coming the other way with this guy leaning on his horn shouting, pig, pig, pig. So naturally, what would you do as a cyclist? You flip in the bird, um, and uh, you dare not, I dare not repeat the things that you would also say as that uh, car went by. This is, this is supposedly a true incident, so uh, the cyclist flipped in the bird uh, and was probably still thinking about the awful driver behavior as he turned a curve and ran straight into a pig. Um, I like that story. It's, it's nice to know that some drivers care about their fellow road users uh, enough to warn them about dangers ahead, but some dangers, very long in the making, 
um, or happen too quickly for effective warnings from Good Samaritans, or the danger itself goes completely unrecognized by drivers, cyclists, and transport agencies. The next longer and much sadder story is about Chris Lee Hong. And uh, it's about just that kind of danger that lurks, I think, in, among many of our largest cities. Chris was killed this past November 2012. Like all stories, this one has a time and a place. It took place last year in Dunedin, uh, my hometown now for, for four years. And it's a lovely place, Dunedin's eighth largest city, and a place I've really uh, grown to, uh, to love and, and to enjoy. But like many New Zealand cities, Dunedin is not a very cycle-friendly place. In recent years, this relatively small town has experienced three cyclist deaths and dozens of injuries on the state highway one ways that traverse the central business district. The first death was to Dr. Jan Brewer in 1999, before cycle lanes had even been painted on the roads. The next one was when I was there in 2011 to Peter Wells after the unprotected cycle lanes had gone in. So after the 2011 death, Spokes, the local cycle advocates group, which I'm a member of, uh, made an official submission to the city council to improve the cycle lanes, calling specific attention to the dooring hazard outside the hospital on the northbound one way as shown in that picture. And I'm quoting here, uh, because I wrote this for Spokes. On some of the existing on-road cycle lanes in Dunedin, parking cars are a serious hazard for cyclists. For example, outside the hospital on Cumberland Street, where cyclists on the cycle lane faces doors opening into the cycle lane on one side and lorries, do I have to translate what lorries are? And lorries right on the edge of a very narrow cycle lane on the other. And those, just to clarify, those are parked so that the driver's side is the side. That's correct. Here. That's correct. <clears throat> then in October 2012, a critically important Canadian uh, injury and cycle infrastructure paper came out in the American Journal of Public Health, showing both the relative safety shown here, the very top uh, is the odds ratio compared to no infrastructure, uh, for cycle tracks, which are protected, separated lanes. Uh, you can see the picture of each of these infrastructures. And the, the, the lessening safety, if you will, as you go down to fewer and fewer infrastructure. Um, that's the confidence interval along the side. It's not a huge number, but you, in, in cycling, when you have limited infrastructure, there are only a few places where you can do work like this. But um, it was a, a, a very clever study and uh, really one of the first of this kind ever done. Much of the infrastructure in the US and Canada has been based on engineering opinion and very little good epidemiology. The other thing that these researchers pointed out was the desirability of that separated structure. So while you had the increasing safety here with those facilities, you also have increasing route preference. And why would that be a good thing? So we get more riders out there who feel comfortable. And if people feel comfortable, you get more riders. When you get more riders, cars get used to them being around more. And uh, what we do observe is safety in numbers. The more cyclists, the more the rate of the cycle injury and interaction with cars uh, goes down. Uh, it's probably lowered speeds as well that, that uh, affects that. But it's also important to, to understand preference. And uh, it's a little busy here, but this route choice holds no matter what kind of cyclist you are. The, the top one, let's see if I can do this right. The top one here, the regular cyclist, and this is the poorer infrastructure, this is the, the, the better infrastructure. There isn't that much difference whether you're a regular cyclist or an occasional cyclist. Uh, they still prefer that off-road structure. Okay, um, let's digress just a second here, because this is an epidemiology uh, lecture, and review some of the basics of, of cycling epidemiology. Uh, an international comparison of cycling deaths is shown here. 
something really stands out, doesn't it? Um, if you're a cyclist in the U.S., you can have up to six times um, both the fatality and the, the injury rate as in some of the, the better places in the world, the Netherlands and Denmark. You know, this isn't a 10%, 30%, 40%, even 100% difference. This is a 600% difference. Um, I looked at U.S. data recently, and this might surprise some of the injury epidemiologists. Uh, when you look at pedal cyclist traffic-related injury for adults over the last 10 years from CDC whiskers, you actually see an increasing incident rate. This is at a time when motor vehicle crashes have, have been decreasing dramatically. Something's going on, and for a great, uh, I, I think to a great extent, these details aren't known because they're hidden. What happens is people look at all ages, and you find children, the, the rate for children has been going down because children are cycling less and less. They're being taken around by cars more and more. So they're hiding this age-specific epidemic that we're seeing. And uh, this is starting to have a toll. As a share of overall traffic fatalities, this is combining bike and pedestrian fatalities. They've jumped from 12% of traffic deaths in 2008 to 16% of traffic deaths in 2011. So there's some things going on there. We're not going to get into all the details on that, but uh, if you're looking for some areas to study and areas in which things are getting worse, it's a good area to look at. Here's some Colorado data that was a little disconcerting that I dug out that uh, was reported from the Vail Daily uh, just this past June. And it said that the number of fatalities has spiked more than 63% just over one year in Colorado. That's, that's, that's of concern. Uh, unfortunately, the growing problem prompted the Colorado Department of Transportation to launch this Share the Road campaign. Do you think there was any evidence base for that campaign? There's a lot of money spent on it, but there's no evidence base and it works. And then even more disconcerting, I hope there's nobody here from uh, the Transportation uh, Department, but this was a quote that the Colorado Senate Transportation Committee is looking into the data, but says funds to fix the problem are hard to come by. So you've got some challenges here in Colorado. All right. Let's get back to uh, our story. So with this new evidence-based information on protected lane safety, Spokes, the advocates group, went further. And on November 10th, publicly called for retrofitting the busy bike lanes. What we said was the era of simply painting lanes on busy roads to create pseudo-cycling routes must now draw to a close. The task of retrofitting existing unprotected bike lanes on busy roads we now know are much safer designs must be begun and begun quickly. Now we turn only nine days later to the short but awful November 19th headline. Can you go back to that other story? What's the deal with the airplane? Uh, sure. What do you think? Well, are you just trying to illustrate about sharing the road? If we treated our roads the way we treated our cyclists, this is what your motor vehicle driver would have to deal with. With a huge vehicle on your right, uh, parking on your left of those other vehicles, and you trying to make your way through wherever you're going to go. Obviously, we don't do this for vehicles. We don't put motor vehicles on, onto runways, but we put bikes onto roadways. So how did you get this picture? <laughs> A um, little bit of magic, a little bit, a okay. little bit of I Photoshop. Was this for real or was this Photoshop? A <laughs> little bit of Photoshop. Gotcha. Okay. This is, uh, I think it's Hong Kong, uh, Hong Kong Airport. I took the photo and then pasted in these things. Okay. <laughs> Just keep it out. All right. You. you don't think that's for real? Yes. Yes. Uh, it, it's a little surprising, basically, you said that we think Colorado is one of the states where people are much more aware of the sense of risk. I have no idea. You're going to have to ask Colorado officials this. Uh, you know, this is my very quick look at what was happening in Colorado, and this spike obviously came out of the Google search, but I don't know what's going on. More writers, uh, different reporting. I doubt it was different reporting. 
Do you have a general sense of where we stand relative to other states? No, I don't. So let's turn nine days later to this headline, Cyclist Killed Outside Dunedin Hospital. Now, I didn't know Chris. This story, though, is really personal. It had been a fine spring morning in Dunedin, clear sunny, clear sunny skies, a temperature around 70 degrees, and the time was 10 a.m. I was actually in my office two blocks away from this incident when the scream of the siren went by my window. Dunedin's a very small town, and it became known very quickly uh, through various channels that uh, a cyclist had been, been killed. Uh, it was apparent from my conversation when I walked by the scene a couple hours later that the cyclist had been doored on one of Dunedin's busiest one-way corridors. And it was clear that after the dooring, he had ended up in the traffic lane, which in turn led to his being run over by a passing stock truck. This all occurred right outside the hospital, right where that picture was taken, at the precise, almost the precise location of the uh, warnings that the cyclist group had put out over the last year. I later learned to my sadness that the person killed was faculty at the University of Otago School of Dentistry, Chris Longhee. He was also a husband and a father of a two-month-old and a two-year-old at the time of his death. Before we get into the details of the crash events, let's learn a little bit more about Chris the person. Chris had been appointed a senior lecturer and came to the university in 2008. He'd grown up in China, where many of you might know cycling is almost a way of life. It's joined by millions of, millions of people in, in China. This really made him a very experienced cyclist, one who always wore a helmet, who always wore high-vis materials. Perhaps it's best we learn about Chris from some of his closest friends themselves. And this is taken from a, a, a Facebook uh, posting to, about him. Let's go this way. Uh. of mine uh, in, in our advocacy group, um, we've been working on setting up a ghost bike. Does anybody not know what a ghost bike is? Should I explain? So it, uh, often, it started in the U.S., I believe, at the site where a cyclist is killed, they'll paint a bike white and put it up to commemorate the, the death. Um, we've gone back and forth on whether we should do that because it, it's often gruesome and, and perhaps reminds people of how dangerous cycling is. So we've decided on doing it on a temporary basis and then putting up a plaque. Uh, but we were talking to his widow to make sure we had her permission to do this. And to this day, she will not go by that spot uh, in, in downtown Dunedin. It's just, it's just too difficult. And it just reminds you that when uh, an injury fatality takes place, the, the burden goes on and on. It's not just the individual that's killed. So getting back to the incident, Chris, we learned, was a victim of Doring. It's one of the more common yet insidious hazards that utilitarian cyclists face in urban areas without good infrastructure. The New Zealand Road Code, like many other countries, warns drivers specifically um, uh, about this hazard to, uh, to other road users. But warnings like you see here by itself usually don't change behavior. And so Dorians continue to occur. 
Here's a video that shows pretty much probably the same sort of scenario that happened to Chris. Watch on the right. So those are the kind of dynamics. It comes up so quickly to the cyclist, you don't have time to react. You hit the door with your steering wheel, so you lose control, and oftentimes you'll, you'll go off to the left into traffic. Now, dooring injuries are reported in New Zealand uh, in the police data. You can see here this little schematic that's actually part of the police report. So that's nice. Um, that means that as an injury epidemiologist, it's not too difficult to find some of these cases that, that are reported. And we find out that in New Zealand, uh, it's about 6% of all cyclists involving a motor vehicle uh, are doored. There are a lot of reasons why doorings are not going to be reported, though. And uh, we actually looked at two different sources. One was the ACC, our national insurance company, and they reported uh, about 150 per year, where the police only reported about 49 per year. But the police data was the only ones that were geographically codable. Um, so that's the, the, the group that we worked with. You can see some of the other features of these data, that it's two-thirds male, um, mostly over the age of, of, of 25. And about one or two deaths a year occur from, from Doreen on average. So like I said, we plotted out the, the Doreen data, put this up on, on Google Maps to make it available. This was actually done, this was, uh, this was started before Chris was killed and we worked on it a little harder to finish it up afterwards and made it available to the whole country to use. Uh, one of the nice things is you can zoom in on this and because it's in Google Maps, you can see the locations in your individual town, see what the high-risk areas are, and go into Street View and actually look at what infrastructure was there at the time the Google truck went by. Now, that doesn't mean that's the way it is now, but you do get some hints of, of what the infrastructure was like. And in Colorado, uh, I wasn't able to find any dooring data, but I did note that the driver's manual did include some safety education. Um, continuing on this epidemiological uh, vein, I was able to find that Chicago did something similar to what we've done in New Zealand. I don't know of any other city that's done this. And again, it depends on what data is available at the local level. But they've plotted uh, all, all their Doring data for about a five-year period, I think. I think this was actually done by a, ra a radio or TV station. Uh, it wasn't done by, by a public health department. And not surprisingly, you can see how the, the main corridors uh, where cycles and cars interact are, are where these patterns of injuries occurred. The only other North American city uh, I could find that had decent Doring data is Toronto, uh, where it's listed as one of the, the top bike crash types, uh, actually ranking third. So let's now explore a little more specifically how Chris, an experienced cyclist, uh, ended up in the fatal Doring. That November morning was actually not much different than many others for Chris. The good thing about his later morning commute was the traffic had already died down a little bit. But, although the traffic on the road died down, the parked car numbers actually increased. So he probably traded the safety and convenience of traveling in a low traffic environment with a higher car door environment. His Daily route took him about three miles to work uh, from this nice suburb over here through mostly flat land along the har harbor um, into downtown. This was his typical route. He'd come up Cumberland Street. That was the street we gave the warning. There's the hospital there, which we had already indicated was a problem. And he was about two blocks, two blocks from work when he was killed. But ahead of him that morning, like all mornings, he faced a gauntlet. A gauntlet not unlike many commuter cyclists face each day where the many potential cyclists simply refuse to run and so don't go out on the road. This is probably very close to what Chris saw the last few seconds of his life. A very narrow cycle lane with varying parking discipline squeezed in by traffic on his right along one of the busiest roads in the city. Now, it doesn't look busy there, but that's because I was taking a photograph and waited till there was no cars around to, 
to get closer to the street. These Google Street images trace the path of his final moments from the view of the road traffic. There's the hospital on the left. You can see the visitor entrance right there. And right about where that gray van is is where the car that was parked the door to. The driver of the vehicle that doored him was actually a good Samaritan. This is, this is the woman. She had just taken a friend to the hospital for a medical visit. She was sitting in the driver's seat of her parked car when her passenger said, what, Beverly, um, the dome light is on in the car. Your door must be open. So she was just about to pull out, but realized the door was ajar. And so without looking, she swung open her door to open it, to, to, to pull it and slam it shut. And unfortunately, at that time, Chris was going by. The door struck the handlebars in the frame of Chris's bicycle, and the impact of the collision knocked him off the bike and directly onto the lane of traffic. This is what was awaiting him. The horrible, the horrible crash sequence ended when Chris was immediately run over by one or more rear wheels of this passing stock truck that happened to be going by. The truck driver was later stopped 15 miles north of Dunedin because he didn't even know he had run anybody over. By the time the second or the third trailer had hit him, you know, he, did, he didn't know anything had happened. So is that the end of the story? From a legal standpoint, perhaps. After the driver pleaded guilty to careless operation of a motor vehicle, and she was fined. And I think she had to do some community service. But I think we need to dig a little bit deeper, maybe even a lot deeper, to understand the other important factors. One of the most important factors, and the one I'm going to focus on, is the unprotected bike lane that Chris entrusted his life with. You can see here the bike lane has a lot of deficiencies. What do you see? Tell me what you see. What are, some, what are the, some of the problems here? Go ahead. Exposed and uh, there was no protection on either side. So anybody can drive in from the right, anybody can pull out from the front. And then obviously anybody, it's like having a random set of mines. Just uh, barriers that pop those, up. Those doors. There's no, uh, there's no signal lights. There's no uh, way to alert. You're a cyclist, right? Because you can't look into the back of a lot of cars because even if they're not dark and you can't see inside the car. So the best you can look at your mirror and even that is not sufficient because this is a very complex traffic environment for a cyclist as you run down the road. So those are things that they faced on the right side, that he faced as a cyclist and the challenges of moving through this zone. What about some of the infrastructure and the things that would have affected the distance that the car would have been parked away? There are some real glaring problems here. Come on. Well, it looks like it's kind of a ditch there. So. This? Yeah, so people yeah. are going to park. This is about a three-inch lip. And what this does to parking behavior, people don't go over it. They're not going to take their 3,000-pound vehicle and, um, and, and, and all its comfort and glory and put it over this three-inch little, little dip. They're going to stay on this side. And so this half a meter, maybe even a little more, of the roadway, it's really roadway and parking way, doesn't get used. And that squeezes the space that's available for the cycle lane. What else do you see? Well, it gets even worse there with the sewer grade. Yeah, I kind of pointed that one out for you. <laughs> it gets worse. Uh, and so any car here, there, it'd be nice if they parked here. That's a meter away. And if all the cars park a meter and closer, that means on this side over here, that meter would be available. But this is a real-life environment. You know, you can't control what every parker does. Uh, and that's why you have to build in margins of safety 
into infrastructure like this. Well, also, it sounds like it's right by the vis by the outpatient. Is that what you said? That's a very good point. So if there's a lot of traffic in and out. I it's a lot of traffic, and what's also critical, it's short-term parking. Right. So, so short-term parking, let's say five minutes per vehicle, you get 20 vehicles per hour at that spot. That's 20 door openings for the, the driver to get out and 20 door openings for the driver to get back in. Usually it's when they're getting out, but this situation was unusual because she was reclosing the door. Um, but that temporary parking is also a risk. And then can you assume, like I know in Denver there's laws, you, you'll get a ticket if you aren't parked close enough? So there's no law like that? I had a discussion with one of our uh, meter maids, if you will, mm -hmm. and I asked him, maid, it was a him, mm -hmm. uh, how many tickets he had given for people parked more than a meter away. And he said he couldn't recall the last time he had done so. And the problem from a cyclist standpoint is all these things can add up together. So here's a very big, wide vehicle, probably a huge door over here, whose parking discipline has brought them off from the side, away from this. And if there was a cycling, this picture, I don't think there was. But you can see how all these things can add up together. Now, I'm not going to go into to all the details here. This is, this is a, a more engineering approach to what's there. But um, taking it all together, what I estimate was missing if it had been designed properly, according to New Zealand Australian standards, uh, this bicycle lane would have had to be out where that red line is to give him, uh, who, whoever went through this, uh, enough space. So what was missing was really uh, 1.2 meters of, of that cycle lane. Uh, this is the proverbial accident waiting to happen. And I don't really think this was by any means a safe cycle lane. And you have to question the ethics and the engineering and the design and the planning and the, the expenditures that led this to be there to attract people, whether it was Chris He or myself or my daughter or anybody else who dared out on this, on this cycleway to go into that cycle lane thinking that they might be safe. Now the Dutch wouldn't allow this to happen. Um, the most recent Dutch guidelines are very blunt. Cycle lanes are not recommended in combination with parking bays. They just simply eliminate the door hazard by not allowing a cycle lane to, to go there. What's also nice about this, and we'll talk about some of these examples, are that separation that makes it even safer for the cyclists. Now after Chris's death, the spokes the need and the advocate group's response was immediate. Built upon our use of pre-established political, social media, and media contacts, we worked really hard over the space of a few days to reinforce the message that we had put out just the, the, the week or two before. Also, fortuitously, we had um, established and reinvigorated our social media presence just five months before Chris's death. So here you can see we had no social media presence and then we started blogging, we started uh, uh, becoming much more visible in the community, and then once Chris was killed, people had a place to go to get more information. We had a place to go to communicate to the community without uh, just going through the newspaper. I will point out that the editorial I had written a week before Chris's death, and it was turned down by the paper, suddenly got accepted the day after Chris's death. So one take home lesson is that by using social media, we had already built the channels to communicate with existing members, with new members, and the public. So the advocacy group was prepared to motivate public opinion and community action. So with all this intense and, and conventional media, driven, I think, in great part by our pre-framing of the issue, um, I hate to tell you how many calls I got saying, did you predict this a week before? Did you predict this a, a year before? That's the kind of story that the, the news media wanted to report on. New Zealand's not a great place, but this became a national story throughout New Zealand. The local city council acted swiftly and decisively, calling for quick wins and long-term fixes from the national agency responsible for the state highway system. So a city highway, a city, a national, 
and the Advocates Task Force was, was quickly put together. Within six months, some of the defined quick wins actually started rolling out on the pavement. This photo shows the first section of several in the Central Business District that was widened from 1.3 meters to 2.4 meters simply by repainting the roadway. Further work is scheduled on these lanes to include hatched buffer zones uh, on these as well. Unfortunately, the, the current transport regulations don't allow anti, uh, don't have a design for buffered painted, painted lanes, and so they can't implement it immediately. We have to get a special committee and go through uh, a several month process to get that approved. I but I'm hopeful that we will. Plan. Can you explain? Pardon? I don't know what you mean by buffer. I'll show you in a minute. Oh. I'll show you a Denver example. Um, so here we see a cyclist along the newly widened lane done this past June, right outside the spot where Chris was killed. You can clearly see the wider margin of safety if the cyclist takes the right part of the road. Uh, and here we see cyclists in a pretty good position, far enough away from the traffic, uh, certainly far enough away from the doors in what is now a safer zone. To the transport agency's credit, perhaps due to the emails flooding the regional director's uh, inbox, somehow the money was quickly found for, for all these changes. It included milling of that uh, seal coat where that protruding lip was to get rid of that so that the people would park in closer. It included changing some of the times on the parking so that we lengthened some of the times so it would uh, change that turnover. We reduced parking in the immediate proximity of some of the, the busiest areas. Uh, and we increased the length of the bus stops in some of the areas there. Bus, buses didn't have enough room to enter into the bus stop and they'd stick out. The, the rear end would stick out. The cyclists would have to go into the traffic lane. So by lengthening the bus stop, we, we avoided that. So it was nice that all those things happened. Uh, it's just too bad that it, it didn't happen in 2011 when the problems were first highlighted. Finally, long-term solutions are also being drawn up focusing in on buffered and protected lanes along the main north-south access. So here you see a buffered lane. There's not a real physical barrier. This isn't going to stop a car from coming over, but it, it indicates to the car that this is not a car zone, so this is what they call a buffered zone. This is Boulder from three days ago. Look how nice and sunny it was three days ago. Um, this is their first buffered lane, and it's very similar to that protected by plastic bollards on the side. And uh, as I took the bus in yesterday, and I had a few minutes downtown, uh, I stopped by your lovely uh, buffered 15th Street um, buffered zone. Uh, you want my opinion on this? Uh, a couple things wrong with it. Um, well, I'm sure it's better infrastructure than what was there before. Uh, there are no bollards. There's no real protection over here. And so, yes, it's going to improve things. Um, but I'm not sure how safe it's going to make everybody feel on this road. So it's an improvement, but probably could be better. Uh, this is the Dutch style alternative. Uh, this one doesn't eliminate parking, but you can see this is a, ro a, a raised footpath, if you will, and it's wide enough that you can stay away from the door zone that's over there. And let's see, which side of the road do they, they drive on? Um, I'm confused now, moving back and forth from New Zealand. <clears throat> Some of the other options look like this. You could have a two-way buffered path on one roadway. That means you don't have to do the infrastructure on two roadways, but then you run into traffic going in different directions, and you especially have problems at intersections. Um, so this one's two-way. Um, we've decided not to go in this direction because of some evidence, again, from that uh, Canadian study that the contraflow lane uh, is at increased risk. So that's Chris's story, the story of the loss of one person. But in a real sense, it's Dunedin's ongoing story, and similar to that uh, of many other people who cycle and that we have unnecessarily lost due to inadequate attention to the safety structure over many, many years. Sadly, sometimes quite often in fact, it takes a real tragedy to inspire change. There's no shame and there should be little hesitation as bicycle and safety professionals and cycle advocates 
in recognizing and saying that. That doesn't make us opportunistic and insensitive. It means taking advantage of the ability to move things forward so these things don't have to happen again and again and again. So thank you all for listening. I hope you consider telling some stories of your own like this uh, in your public health careers. So thank you. I'm sorry? Uh, another policy angle might be, I'm curious, what happens to the motorists who uh, are responsible or contributors to these accidents? Because it seems like there's probably also just penalties um, as insurance for and so the motorists themselves would take care of the Did you prompt this? <laughs> I, I just wrote a paper um, that was published in the New Zealand uh, Australian uh, Journal of Public Health um, addressing the very issue of increasing penalties for motorists who injure vulnerable road users. Number one, there's no evidence that increasing penalties make a difference. And if you think about it, and actually I was at a, a cycling conference a year ago. This was. Um, a room full of cycle advocates, the, 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 the cream de la cream of people who should have known what the cycle laws were in New Zealand. And I asked this whole room full, including legislators, what is the penalty for careless driving in New Zealand? Nobody knew. So if you double what people already don't know, what are you going to achieve in terms of knowledge uh, and, and deterrence? So I think it's important from a restorative justice issue uh, because oftentimes people are hurt, families are devastated, and the penalties are very minor. But if you think about it in terms of prevention, uh, there's no evidence that increasing penalties like that make a difference. Now, can you educate um, road users? Like I said at the beginning, there are share the road campaigns in almost every state, uh, uh, in, in every country, motorized country, because A, it's cheap, uh, you can print the materials and you can get it out. And if you're careful not to evaluate it too closely, you can get money to do it again. Um, I just came from uh, a cycle conference in Boulder and listened to a woman from a state I won't name uh, who had these share the road stickers that you could put on the back of your bike and your car to try to get this across. And she went through what sounded like, in principle, a, a good public health program, well-targeted messages, uh, aimed at the time when people were, were uh, most likely to use it. Um, but you get reinforcing opposite messages so often because you, your chances of getting ticketed are, are, are very slow, are very low. And most of the time people aren't aware that they're actually doing something that puts a cyclist at risk. That's what it really boils down to. And so if people don't know that they're behaving in a way that is going to put a cyclist at risk, there's no behavior to think about even changing. So until someone can show me a study that shows that that works, um, I, I think we ought to be putting the money into educating legislators about the importance of infrastructure that does work. I, did that? So, Go ahead. Of, I mean, I have to think this is the motorist too, was sort of the, the initial contributor. Well, one contributor. of the contributors. Yeah. yeah, I mean, if she had gotten charged with manslaughter, I guarantee you people would be taking more care. So How can you guarantee us that? I wish you could. I wish we could. But I also asked this room of cyclists, how many of you have ever opened a door without looking? I raised my hand, and the same thing happens here. We're all human. We, you know, the, 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 again, the reinforcing behavior is you don't have to look, because 999 times out of 1,000, nothing happens. That's the reinforcing behavior. And then that one out of a thousand, one out of ten thousand, when Chris He is coming by, results in, in, a, in, a, in a tragedy. Yeah. So I think I've gotten better at opening doors. It's because I've had enough near misses of different kinds. So when I was 15, I got doored on my way. I blamed it on a rival church. <laughs> <laughs> I was really late for Sunday school, and uh, right before I got to the intersection, this one church, bam. And I slid across the intersection and I had a perfectly brand, wonderful brand new pair of wool Sunday school trousers. And when I came into Sunday school, they were all really worried about me because I'd slid on certain surfaces going across the intersection. 
And uh, the fellow's, of course, very apologetic. And I was really quite upset, and so I screwed my handlebar and then totally down the street. So I think that made me a little more sensitive than some might be looking, yet I still did it. And I realized that one reason, when I put a little uh, round mirror, and I need to do it on, I've got a new car, and I haven't done it, and I've been feeling bad about it, because I realized that a flat mirror only inevitably gives you one field of vision. And if you put one of those semi, like hemispheric mm -hmm. kind of mm -hmm. reflectors, you're much more likely to, to pick up an odd movement, whether it's on the right or on the left, that alerts you to all kinds of things that are overtaking trucks, bicyclists, you name it. So I think that if we're looking for one engineering device, it would be interesting to study. That would be cheap. I think the thing is like a buck or two bucks and you get a new place. I, I'm all for doing research. I'm all for, you know, full employment for injury epidemiologists. So it's a cue. But it's a cue. It's just a visual cue. And related to that is a research that says that people who ride bicycles are less likely to run over a bicyclist in a car. And that people who drive cars are more aware of bicyclists of the limitations of drivers in seeing a smaller object that's not a threat to them and a whole bunch of other things. Um, the, the real complexity to me is the varying speed. So we just had our first conviction of a bicyclist for homicide. So I bicycle on that very thing you showed in Boulder. I just started picking up bicycling again three years ago for the first time in a half century. And uh, Boulder's in a pretty good place. Yeah. I try to stay off the highways because we've had a number of deaths. But inevitably, at times, I get on there, and all the time on that highway, I'm thinking about this issue. Um, and it, it, the way I've been thinking about what you've been showing us is velocities when you commute. I just think it's almost inevitable. I mean, we lost, our friends lost their only son in Kansas when a car came over the curb and it struck him off the sidewalk. But everybody in engineering, this kind of, they say you've got to separate it completely. And the Dutch do that. But they also have an environment in which the highway speeds. Right. And the way the communities are organized lends itself to people being more connected with each other. Colorado, I mean, the, route, the speed limits have just been going up all over the United States, 70, 80 miles per hour. And the studies are showing that you're not getting greater fatality rates because you're out on these very wide areas and there's separated traffic. And so not the speed per se, but I'm worried because we're going to have a bike path on the road turnpike. That's going to be the answer to yes. That's my, well, that's my yeah, the, the Dutch have figured this all out. You know, there are more complexities I could have shown you in their code. Yeah. They take speed into account. They take the number of vehicles into account. They take the distances into account. And they won't allow those situations you're talking about by design. So if we're looking for regulations, it seems to me that might be at the level. If you start thinking of national transportation regulations worldwide, like helmets eventually, seatbelts eventually, it might be that it's only going to be with that kind of solid evidence that we say any civilized nation will begin to reflect these standards, like the Dutch of Rome and others, and then have to adjust them so that maybe when you're getting on the interstates, I don't know how we're going to solve that problem. But well, there are bicycle highways that are not on highways. <laughs> and uh, I'm just showing here the uh, the... 10 basic Haddon prevention strategies. Haddon thought about all this years ago. Bill Haddon is the, the grandfather of injury prevention, and neither Carol or I would be here probably if, if Bill Haddon hadn't done this work. And number six is separate with a physical barrier. The, 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 the person who, who's at risk from what that energy force is. And we don't do that enough in injury prevention. I get back to the, the plane in the car. Uh, that we separate, but we don't do it for, for cyclists uh, and cars. We do it for cars and pedestrians. Uh, and a lot of the reason we don't is historical and it has to do with a whole philosophy called vehicular cycling, which was the few cyclists that were out there wanted to be have full um, uh, rights to be on the road, even if it would kill them and even if it would leave other people very uncomfortable being on the road. We're finally moving away from that 
in, in the U.S. And I think we're going to be able to to work more on physically separate on physical separation as a means to reduce the uh, the bicycle injury toll. Um, what we have focused on in public health, and I'm responsible for this as well. My first paper was a helmet study, um, and that's fine. Helmets are good. I wear a helmet. We can debate whether a helmet should be a require, requirement or not, but I wear a helmet. But um, by only focusing in on helmets, we're only focusing in on trying to prevent injury after the mechanical force has, has already been exchanged. And that's hard to do. Uh, you, actually, the, there are some airbags now for, for bicycles. Um, but um, it's insufficient, and I wish the my injury colleagues, and again, myself included, had focused more on, on number six um, 10, 20 years ago than we did focusing in on number four. Oh, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, um, I work over in Inglewood, and Dartmouth is a pretty, it's the bike lane, but I won't ride my bike to work because after, after you cross over Santa Fe, there is no bike lane. Um, before Santa Fe, there is, but uh, my coworker rides, and I've ridden a couple of times. I always get up on the sidewalk, which then is illegal. I but it's safe. <laughs> but, I mean, there's just, it's so scary, over the, and it's in this industrial area, and um, this warehouse district, and it's just funny to me that they would call it a bike road when there is actually no place for a biker to be riding. Yeah. And Denver's not as bad a place to cycle as, as many cities. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's probably rated in the top 10 in the country because it's got some good infrastructure and, and they're beginning, but they have a ways to go. It's, it's not a Portland, it's not a Boulder, um, it's not a Minneapolis, um, but hopefully we'll see some, some changes here. Just wanted to go back to penalties. Um, it does seem well, so often when you read about an accident, um, the uh, culprit or the driver is not cited in many instances. Um, or that goes under investigation, and they're real. To me, it's, it doesn't seem like there's an equality in the way they're treated when they get a cyclist. Quite often. Well, I mean, that's why people are calling for vulnerable road <laughs> users. But there are often car crashes that are treated the same way. Mm -hmm. You know, if a person wasn't drunk, if the intent wasn't there. If the sun got in your eyes, or a child was crying in the back seat, you're momentarily distracted. Uh, it's careless driving, but there aren't big penalties associated with it because neither you or I, you know it could be you or I who also made a careless mistake like that. We want to design the human element out of our transportation system. That's what Vision Zero is all about, and and sustainable safety and and those kinds of things. If we rely on the human. Uh, we're not going to have a 100% safe system. So, Hank, on that note, um, are any of the new um, technologies being used in cars to, being designed to address the, the door issue? I mean, any of you know, the back? I've been radars. looking. I've been looking. Uh, you know, Google has this uh, 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 automatic driver. I have no idea what happens when when they see when the the, the mecha when the electronics sees a cyclist. I have no idea how sensitive they are to that. I'm very dubious yeah. that that new technology um, has been tested appropriately in the real world uh, and can react properly to, to this kind. But most of the time, cars don't react because they don't see it as a hazard, a risk to them. Uh, I mean, occasionally they do. But occasionally cyclists make mistakes. And, and car drivers might be able to help avoid the situation, but but you would think I mean there could be you know it would be really annoying for drivers probably, but you know watch for cyclists as you as you unlock the door. You know, Carol, I was actually thinking what you said the same way because the Subaru is not coming out. A lot of brands are with these ahead of you and behind you detection systems that uh -huh. take over the car. But I've never heard anybody talk about having the rear view mirror on the side as you open. Well. With if a little detector, it, you know, wouldn't have to be very technology Technology's there. Is it a matter if it's a, what if it's a car? I mean, we've had a bunch of people with their car doors taken off because they open in front of cars. So there's a good reason for people to spend, if it was a small amount of money, or if it was a requirement. If they had to put it on there. Well, but what if you don't have good dooring data around the country? You can't even get 
to proposing the regulations because people are going to say, what's the cost benefit of this? How many, how many cyclists are you going to save? And we don't have good data to know that. So that gets back to, to injury surveillance and, and better transportation data. But I think it's a really nice example of using a, a personal story combined with data and combined with an advocacy approach. I mean, I think it's a really nice example for the students in the room of, of how you put those things together and how they they all draw on their own scientific backgrounds, but they're um, it's, it's the whole package. Yep. On data reporting, it seems like you get some really pretty good data rather quickly in New Zealand. Um, here, there's such a lag time, and the uh, elements in the report are lacking. Yeah. Um, it's so fixable. How, that how did that get generated? Because we're working on that now. It's, it's, it's fixable. You know, everybody's coming out with these uh, smartphone-based, tablet-based data collection systems. There's no reason why these things can't be integrated into it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's happening at a time, though, when budgets are being cut and personnel are being cut. So trying to do something new uh, can be challenging. Um, we need to find the money to do it. You know, that attitude that we saw from the state legislature spokesperson wasn't, wasn't really positive. Um, about making making needed changes. So, so from a methodological point of view, Colorado and New Zealand have roughly the same physical limit overall space and the same population. And what happens is every state, some states are really good, other states are not. So if you just say, wait a minute, I don't have to have national data. I can take the best states in terms of making the data available. I've got something that's the size of a nation in many parts of Europe. And it should be just as valid. Uh, it's just it's more accessible and more convenient. That's what I did my master's that way with Wisconsin data. And there were 360 some thousand records available on punch card, well, on a big spool. And that was back in the 1970s. So uh, there's some states that are really quite good. And it, it, it could be done. Uh, it requires, uh, you know, uh, health people and injury people working together with transportation people. Carol's done those battles and, and been in those committees and uh, hopefully we'll uh, involve other people here to see what is there and, and, and what needs to be done. You know, I've listed several projects here that are Colorado specific that, that uh, needs to be done, but we've got to find the time and the money. You've got the expertise, so uh, maybe I'll come back in five years and see new data and all these problems uh, on the way to being fixed. Great. Thank you, Hank. I'll take your evaluation. And uh, I know we had a little smaller turnout today, probably because of the weather, but this was videotaped.